Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us here today for this webinar as part of the USAID CEDAR discussion series. I'm Michael O'Mealy and our topic today focuses on sustainable agriculture, forestry, and land use in Southeast Asia where countries are working to reduce greenhouse gases by implementing their national climate change commitments and other strategies. Southeast Asia continues to have some of the highest rates of deforestation in the world, however, driven largely by land conversion for agricultural expansion and overharvesting to meet growing demands. It is possible to increase agricultural and forest productivity while reducing greenhouse gas emissions but doing so requires harnessing the power of the private sector and international markets to accelerate climate smart investment and finance. We have two global thought leaders with us today who are at the leading edge of these issues, working with banks, investors, global corporations, and businesses to mobilize investment and finance at scale in the region. Before introducing our speakers, I'd like to share a little information about the CEDAR discussion series. CEDAR's full name is Climate Economic Analysis for Development, Investment, and Resilience, and it's a five-year USAID-funded project that is helping countries to scale up low-carbon, climate-resilient development. CEDAR supports countries in conducting the economic, financial, and other analyses needed to make the business and economic case for taking strategic climate actions. As part of the CEDAR project, this discussion series engages public, private, and civic sector leaders from around the world in exploring the most critical issues related to climate change, clean energy investment, and sustainable landscapes management. And through connecting with global innovators and practitioners such as yourselves, all of you joining us here today, we're able to share and build on each other's experiences and in the process become more effective as a global community in our collective efforts. For our agenda today, I'll give a quick introduction to set the stage for our topic and then turn it over to our first featured speaker, Johan Formont, who is the Senior Finance Advisor for USAID Green Invest Asia. Johan is joining us today from Bangkok, and he'll share insights from working with investors across Southeast Asia to identify new business models, expand networks, and remove barriers to create new opportunities for climate smart finance in the region. Then we have Tony Cientonas, Climate Smart Agriculture Manager for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, joining us today from Geneva. Tony will discuss how leading companies and financial institutions are working to increase food production in Southeast Asia while transforming agricultural systems to be more resilient to climate risks and stressors. And then the most important part of our event today is an open forum during which we'll ask for your questions to Johan and Tony on these issues. So please be thinking about what you'd like to ask and be ready to type in your questions using the webinar comment field. So to set the stage, I'd like to take us back briefly to the landmark Paris Agreement in December 2015, when countries agreed to significantly do reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the energy, land use, and other key sectors as part of our global response to the threats posed by climate change. Private sector leaders have embraced the business and economic case for ambitious climate action as well. In the forestry sector, companies have committed to move toward net zero deforestation in key commodity supply chains by 2020, working with the Tropical Forest Alliance 2020. In food production, agribusiness leaders have pledged to make 50% more food available while reducing greenhouse gas emissions 50% by 2030, working with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And increasingly, global and regional markets are calling for commodities certified as sustainable, and leading banks, investors, and companies are beginning to develop climate smart products and strategies in response. In Southeast Asia's dynamic markets, however, where agriculture and forestry supply chains oft, often span multiple countries and involve a wide variety of actors along each value chain, Countries, companies face multiple challenges to achieving their sustainable production goals, while at the same time, national and subnational governments in the region are seeking financing to promote and accelerate climate smart agriculture, forestry, and land use. And as a result of this disconnect, 
public and private sector leaders are missing opportunities to meet their targets, to reduce climate, climate risks, to support local job creation, and to foster greater societal health and economic well-being. So at this critical stage, as countries prepare to take stock of the collective progress we've made under the Paris Agreement later this year, it is essential that we identify opportunities now for greater public-private sector collaboration in order, to, in order to mobilize private sector investment and finance at scale. In October last year, eight countries in Southeast Asia came together in Bangkok with leading financial institutions, investment groups, corporations, and development partners to do just that. Delegations from Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ind Indonesia, Laos, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam identified and discussed priority needs and opportunities to better align public and private sector finance and to accelerate investment for climate smart agriculture and land use to help achieve both country and corporate commitments. This workshop was sponsored by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization with collaboration from USAID, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and other key partners. CEDAR organized the third day of the workshop, which identified key challenges and priorities for accelerating investment and finance for climate smart agriculture and forestry, and I'll briefly run through those now. Prior to the workshop, CEDAR worked with private sector leaders in the region to identify the near-term priority actions that they Prior to the workshop, CEDAR worked with private sector leaders in the region to identify the near-term priority actions that they felt were needed in order to help companies, banks, and farmers to invest more and scale up climate smart agriculture and forestry in the region. The top four identified actions by these private sector leaders included finance, specifically identifying pathways and solutions to enable small and medium-sized enterprises to access more financing, communication, facilitating regular dialogues between national-level policymakers with businesses and smallholder farmers, and finding a common language or understanding on climate change actions between the private sector and government. Policy, specifically developing and implementing policies that incentivize or penalize companies that pursue or do not pursue climate smart approaches, and data, improving data sharing with farmers and upstream commodity producers, including data related to weather and best practices for climate resilience. Also, aggregating, reporting, and verifying greenhouse gas emission reductions achieved by all stakeholders, toward national climate change commitments so that we can better track our progress. In the October workshop, we focused in on recommendations specifically to improve public-private private sector communication in order to mobilize investment, which, based on CEDAR's interviews with public and private sector leaders in Cambodia, Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam, included facilitating regular public-private public sector dialogues focused on improving the policy and regulatory environment for investment, and on supporting information sharing on the viability of climate smart practices in order to encourage broader uptake. Another key recommendation was to improve the general understanding between the public and private sectors on climate smart practices in agriculture and forestry, and as a result of, as a desired outcome of improved public-private sector coordination in these ways, the leaders that we interviewed hoped to see new policy incentives developed to promote climate smart investment and greater access to finance for small and medium-sized enterprises and small-scale producers. In addition, we focused in the October workshop on emerging strategies for aligning public and private sector finance showcasing new initiatives of national banks, commercial banks, and finance associations in the region. These key strategies included new climate smart programs that have been developed by central and national banks to deploy more finance to small and medium-sized enterprises and small-scale producers, new approaches for using public and international finance in order to leverage additional private sector capital through blended mechanisms, new strategies to reduce transaction costs through farmer cooperatives and rural credit associations in order to reach more small-scale producers, 
and new approaches that banks are using to mitigate and minimize risks, including through proactive policies, loan guarantees, and index-based insurance. And finally, having identified the key challenges, priorities, and opportunities to improve public-private sector coordination and alignment for climate smart investments, country teams in the October workshop work to develop private sector engagement strategies aligned with their national climate change commitments. And it was really great to see the momentum and excitement build for working on these issues, as well as the, the, the dynamic exchange and coordination between countries, companies, banks, and investors at the event. And I am very excited to have Johan and Tony with us today because they and their teams are serving as key catalysts for their work. And so I'm very much looking forward to their insights. And with that, it is my true pleasure to introduce Johan Formont, who will share insights from working with investors across Southeast Asia to identify new business models and opportunities for climate smart finance in the region. Johan is the financing lead for the regional USAID Green Invest Asia initiative, which has a target of arranging $400 million of investment into climate smart agricultural and forest products and a target of 25 million tons of carbon dioxide reduced, avoided, or sequestered by 2022. Johan has extensive experience advising banks, insurance companies, microfinance institutions, and development finance institutions in more than 15 countries in Africa and Asia, and strong, ex and strong expertise in agricultural, renewable energy, and SME finance. First, let me start by introducing our program. So USAID Green Invest Asia is a five-year regional program funded by USAID. We are based out of uh, Bangkok and active in Southeast Asia with a focus on Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, and Indonesia. And our mandate is to increase private sector finance for businesses with sustainable land use practices. So as Michael mentioned, Green Invest Asia has two main objectives catalyzing $400 million in private sector investments towards sustainable land use, and resulting in 25 million tons of CO2 equivalent sequestrated, reduced, or avoided. And Green Invest Asia serves as a catalyst mechanism, as a bridge for the private sector. We are not a loan or grant-making facility, but our team provides direct technical assistance. We identify and develop a pipeline of promising businesses, to attract investment, and we focus on enterprises that fall within the so-called missing middle, that is SMEs and mid-growth businesses. We engage with financial institutions to link them up to investment opportunities, facilitate and structure financial transactions, and we work with some of those institutions, particularly local banks, on integrating ESG, environmental social governance standards, in their loan product design and loan assessment. And finally, we connect business and financial sector to create a community of practice about sustainable land use financing. So on the opportunity side, there are several global and regional trends that are creating the conditions for market growth in the AFOLU sector in Asia. A major trend is obviously that in response to customer demand in developed and emerging markets, large corporations are increasingly trying to make their supply chain more sustainable. Mars, Mars, for example, pledged to invest around $1 billion in its sustainability plan. And that translates practically into an interest, for example, for SRP rice in Asia. Unilever, another example, has very ambitious sustainability goal for the supply chain. And that translates, for instance, by innovative projects, such as their, their work in Vietnam with IDH to increase production of sustainable tea with small producers. Another important factor is that with 4 million hectares of organic farmland, Asia has become a major grower and exporter of organic crops. The ASEAN is also expecting to see food demand increase by as much as 40% by 2050. And the ASEAN integration is projected to create 4.5 million new jobs in agriculture by 2025. So the market demand is clearly increasing for sustainable production in the AFOLU sector in Asia. Financing is obviously a key condition to enable these opportunities. What we observe is that the amount of private funding available for climate finance worldwide is huge. It's about more than 
$400 billion annual average for 2015 and 2016, with two-thirds of that coming from private funding. In the ASEAN alone, the current amount invested for climate finance is around $40 billion per year. So these numbers are really, really big, but it's important to realize that a very large share of this funding is targeting renewable energy, infrastructure, and green transportation. Two examples of this in relation to green bonds. For all green bonds raised in 2017 in ASEAN Plus 3, 70% is allocated to renewable energy alone. And second example, if we look at IFC commitment in finance for, from its green bond worldwide in 2017, out of almost $5 billion, there is not one project for sustainable land use in Asia. So that is not to say that funding is not available, but it's important to separate sustainable land use finance from the larger flow of green finance. And this is despite the fact that the need for sustainable land use funding is very large. The diagram that you see on the, on the slide was created by DBS Bank and UNEP, and it shows that the financing opportunity in the ASEAN between 2016 and 2030 is estimated to be an additional $400 billion for sustainable land use, with $170 billion for food and agriculture production alone. There are also an increasing number of funds and investors incorporating sustainable land use in their investment scope, including major banks like Rabobank with its new $1 billion fund for climate smart agriculture. And what we hear from investors with whom we work is that by and large, funding is available. The market trend is also clear, as I discussed earlier. But that's not sufficient to move finance into business models that shift to sustainable land use practices. And there are two main reasons why investing in sustainable land use, particularly in SME suppliers, remains a challenge. The first challenge is that the missing middle businesses, those who make the foundation of supply chain, often do not fit investors' requirements in terms of collateral, in terms of profit margin, often do not fit investors' requirements in terms of collateral, in terms of profit margin, operational risk, transparency, and the capacity to tell their result and their operation. And the second reason is that identifying these medium-sized and mid-growth businesses with sustainable practices and the capacity to scale, market access, technical capacities, human resources, is a challenge. These businesses are a scarce commodity, and identifying them is difficult and time-consuming for investors. So far, I have talked primarily of mid-growth companies and SMEs. But it's important to remember that 40% of the total farm area in Asia is held by farmers with less than 2 hectares. And farmers with less than 10 hectares provide up to 80% of the food supply in Asia. So when we talk about sustainable level land use and land users and producers, we talk to a large extent about smallholders. But for most financiers, to the exception of MFIs and cooperatives, they cannot operate on the small or the scale. The transaction costs are much too high, especially in rural areas. So Green Invest Asia's focus is therefore on identifying business models with a sufficient scale to attract investors. The key strategy for us, one of the key strategies to overcome this challenge is to work with aggregators, that is intermediary in the transaction that bring together a large number of producers to enable a sufficient scale of transaction. And aggregators can be multinational in relation to their SME suppliers. They can be large buyer in contract farming model, input supplier, for instance. In, in the slide in front of you, I mentioned a few examples of this uh, business model. For example, Unilever that we discussed earlier. And if I go to the next slide, two examples of contract farming within the, the value chain, so financing within a contract farming model. And on the last slide that I want to show you, we see a diagram of how Green Investasia engages with the investors, commercial bank, impact investors, family fund, and other sources of finance to catalyze private finance. And some of the major challenges we have identified working with financial institutions are, are 
the capacity to develop environment and social visit visibility in the supply chain. Assessing a corporate is relatively simple for a bank or investor, but assess assessing the full supply chain that is below that corporate, all the small SMEs and producers that are producing for this corporate, is much more challenging. For banks, assessing the environmental risk and integrating and incorporating ESG in their management process. Identifying mid-growth mid businesses with the capacity for scale. Another challenge is to support businesses to become investment ready, because there are some very good businesses in the region that are commercially working very well, but that doesn't mean that they are investment ready and they sometimes need support in that. And the last challenge is structuring risk in sustainable land use transaction. I will talk about this very soon. So as you can see in the diagram, our main areas of intervention on the finance side are mirroring these needs. The first thing is that we do is pipeline origination and development. So we identify businesses that meet the requirement from bank in terms of financial attractivity, and we help them to become investment ready. The second is that we support financial institu uh, institution to understand ESG management, and through this support, increase hopefully the appetite for sustainable land use lending. And the third one is that we facilitate access to sustainable land use funding from blended finance, as we discussed earlier, into banks and financial institutions. We also try to de-risk investment opportunity by bringing in mechanisms such as the USA DCA guarantee. And we crowd in a number of financiers with different risk profile to enable transactions that may not be possible for a single investor. And finally, we match businesses with the right type investors for their growth stage. And to close my presentation, I want to mention that at the moment, Green Investasia has engaged with more than 40 investors active in, active in sustainable land use in Southeast Asia, from very large international bank to local bank, development finance, institution, impact fund, with all of them a very diverse range of financial instruments from equity to very long-term debt, working capital, grants, guarantee, etc. And the next stage for us is to match them with the right company that we identify through our port pipeline development. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Johan, for those important insights on the demand and opportunities for sustainable land use finance in the region and how USAID Green Invest Asia is working to move that finance into business models for sustainable land use. I, I really appreciate your thoughts on that. Next up is Tony Ciantonis from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development to discuss how leading companies and financial institutions are working to increase food production while transforming agricultural systems to be more climate resilient. Tony is the Regional Program Manager for Climate Smart Agriculture for WBCSD, bringing 15 years of experience in advising businesses and the public sector on corporate sustainability, agriculture, and climate, and climate change. Previously, he advised the Ethiopian government on mainstreaming climate change into policies to support small-scale farmers, and he advised the private sector on value chain climate solutions across Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Tony is also a part-time dairy farmer, which I think is fantastic, bringing those real-time on-the-ground perspectives to these issues. So Tony, it is a true delight having you with us here today, and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael. Just to check that you can hear me? Yep, you bet. Coming through loud and clear. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, USAID, and everyone for having me today. Um, an interesting, I guess, piece about the background is you, you look at Ethiopia as a background, something that I was involved in, and interestingly, Ethiopia looks towards East Asia um, for its development model from an agriculture-rich past. Um, so there's an interesting link there, and it's great to be talking um, um, about East Asia today. So I'm just going to talk quickly about WBCSD um, and then about our Climate Smart Agriculture project. Um, I've selected out a few solutions. Um, Johan has talked in, in fantastic detail about the finance side. I wanted to talk a bit more about some of the solutions um, which are being scaled up um, on the ground. 
um, and then also finish off with a few areas of food for thought, if you like, on, on emerging issues as we see them um, at WBCSD. So WBCSD was founded in uh, 92, uh, just after the Rio Earth Summit. Um, our goal is to deliver the SDGs through uh, different work programs on transformation. Uh, we're a membership organization. We've got around 200 multinational members. Uh, 70 of those are in our food, land, and water program, uh, which works from farm to fork. Uh, we also have 42 members with their headquarters in Asia. Um, it's one of our fastest growing regions. Um, at WBCSD, the, our theory of change is around three areas. Uh, firstly, value, which is about collaborating along the value chain. Uh, secondly, around impact in terms of scaling up and driving solutions um, in the regions and on the ground. And thirdly, having a, a, a voice, a joint voice on uh, things like UN negotiations on climate change uh, for the private sector. But it's worth mentioning here that a lot of the work we do has to drive the integration of sustainability into financial disclosures for corporate reporting. All of the work that we're talking about today, about the importance of finance and investment, um, is something which needs to be a material issue for all of the companies uh, involved in this process, so that sustainability and corporate responsibility isn't seen as a side issue um, that isn't important for shareholders, shareholders and, and key decision makers. Our program on food, land and water consists of several projects. I'm working on the Climate Smart Agriculture Program, which emerged in 2015 in the lead up to uh, COP21 in Paris. But we also have important programs in areas such as uh, FRESH, which is Food Reform for Sustainability and Health. This is addressing the challenge of both the fact that we have one billion uh, hungry in the world, but one billion overweight as well. Issues such as food loss and waste, issues such as the true cost of food, uh, which are important in this context. The Soft Commodities Forum, this is the first time that the ABCD group of major soft commodity traders uh, have come together. Um, in particular, they're tackling collaboratively issues around deforestation and degradation. Uh, these are uh, ADM, Bungi, Cargill, uh, and Dreyfus. And this is quite an important um, tracking back to what Johan was talking about in terms of aggregators um, and big buyers of, of large volumes of um, food and, and crops. And lastly, we have our water program, which is led uh, out of India and includes water smart agriculture. So the types of challenges that many of us are aware of, uh, but it's worth touching on those again um, from our members' perspective, is about addressing the fact that 9 billion people uh, will need to be fed by 2050, um, agriculture is the most vulnerable sector to the impacts of climate change, but is also responsible for generating at least 25% um, of um, greenhouse gas emissions, which includes the, the food value chain as well. And importantly, at the moment, 90% of governments have put climate change mitigation and adaptation as a priority within their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. Um, this is really important because it's basically saying governments have committed to agriculture mitigation and adaptation and therefore it's crucial that development partners, the civil society and the private sector can come together in delivering solutions that will be needed to meet those NDCs. So our members have targeted what we call the three pillars, if you like, of, uh, of CSA, Climate Smart Agriculture. Um, around the importance of making 50% more nutritious food available um, by 2030. And I'll mention the importance of the word availability, for example, which is that a third of, of food is um, lost or wasted along the value chain. This has a huge impact on meeting production targets and mitigation targets. Uh, strength strengthening the climate resilience of farming communities, particularly smallholder farmers, um, as well as reducing commercial greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. That includes the value chain, so that's uh, scope three uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then at a more specific level, um, we have put in place five key action areas and focus regions where our members um, are operating and um, making impact. Uh, one is the importance of smallholder resilience, 
Um, I mentioned smallholders already. Um, OLAM are a key member of WDCSD and lead in this area. Uh, scaling up finance, Rabobank are a key member of WBCSD and Johan talked about their fund with you and environment. Um, around the importance of monitoring and reporting. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, it's crucial that our members are putting in place science-based targets for addressing climate smart agriculture, um, as well as um, having more detailed methodologies for looking at things like resilience with smallholder farmers that uh, work into their supply chain. Uh, the importance of tackling agriculture-driven deforestation. I've mentioned food loss and waste um, already, in particular within the CSA program. We're quite focused around uh, food loss, particularly at the post-harvest stage, for example. Uh, and then a number of focus regions, including the ASEAN uh, group of countries um, and India. And some of the examples of what we're doing, um, the importance of providing clarity and unity in a global climate dialogue. Um, so WBCSD I mentioned already at COP21, but we come to all of the climate summits um, to give a unified, clear voice on what's needed. Uh, we've been talking about the importance to the UN Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change of you know, scaling up finance and availability that Johan's been talking about and we're talking about today, but also the implementation of solutions on the ground and making sure we're focused on uh, doing rather than uh, talking. Uh, identifying key focus areas for Rabobank's fund uh, has been important. Uh, leveraging private sector support in multilateral donor funding, and I'll talk a little bit about the Global Environment Facility in a second, as well as driving up CSA solutions in regions uh, that we work in uh, with public and with civil society partners. And just to talk a little bit about uh, some of these solutions. Um, I've selected some examples here, but this is by no means exhaustive. We work closely with the CGIAR, in particular CCAS at the CGI, CGIAR, around what these solutions would be, working with our members to make sure that that is uh, passed down to the regions. And just to touch on a few of these, uh, firstly, regions. And just to touch on a few of these, uh, firstly, an um, alternate wet dry of rice, uh, where less flooding of the fields is taking place, which reduces these anaerobic processes. This can reduce greenhouse gases by up to 30 to 70 percent. Uh, Kellogg has been working in this area in Asia, particularly in places like India. Um, Climate-informed advisories, um, low-cost, high-tech weather stations and data services. These are crucially important in enabling smallholder farmers to make anticipatory decision-making processes that are relevant to their farm. Um, as well as enabling the effective use of uh, fertilizer um, inputs and therefore driving down greenhouse gas emissions. Again, particularly applicable in, in Asia and in, in Africa. Digital agriculture. Um, I mean, everyone uh, on this call, I'm sure, probably has their own smartphone. Uh, but the importance of using digital agriculture as a way to improve the speed at which real-time information can be given to smallholder farmers. Microsoft is uh, one of WDCSD's members and is working with us on uh, climate smart agriculture. Um, and by 2020, this market alone is going to be involving an additional 350 million farmers uh, who will use services worth around 2.5 billion worldwide. It's a crucially important part. Um, but then also the importance of a safety net through uh, weather index insurance and the, and the importance of bundling that to existing microfinance schemes. Um, and then finally, blended finance between public and private financing and the importance, as Johan was talking about, the de-risking of that finance through uh, public sources. And then maybe just talking a little bit more detail um, about some of the work we've been doing in ASEAN um, is around um, inclusive rice landscapes programs. Uh, this brings together a number of public, private, and civil society partners around rice growing landscapes in the ASEAN region, uh, the Mekong Delta, for example. Um, and this is a major uh, proposal that we're working on with the Global Environment Facility, uh, with a number of members, including Kellogg, OLAM, Rabobank, and then a number of um, implementation uh, organizations, which includes UN Environment, FAO. I see some of you on the phone today, which is great to see. Sustainable Rice Platform, GIZ, IRI, 
And then importantly, our regional counterparts at the Business Council for Sustainable Development, we had regional network partners in Indonesia, Singapore, and Vietnam. This is driving through solutions for smallholder farmer livelihoods, wetlands restoration, biomass, I've mentioned alternate wet dry, and looking at the issue of nutrition, extension capacity building, and soil management, um, and so on. So this is crucially important, um, and we're going to be meeting at the Jeff Council member meeting um, in Da Nang in, uh, in June, uh, which will be important to talk more about um, how we're scaling up that program. And just to give a few facts about rice and why this has come onto the radar uh, for uh, WDCSD and many of our partners, uh, it's a staple crop for 3.5 billion people. It accounts for 19% of dietary energy worldwide, provides livelihoods for a billion people, um, produced by 144 million um, farmers, most of whom are smallholder farmers in particular in Asia, uses 40% of the world's irrigation water, uh, responsible for 10% of methane emissions, and in some cases up to 20% of national emissions for some countries. Um, it also represents 15% of the world's wetlands. Um, and production must increase by 25% by 2050 to meet global demand. So this is one of the reasons why for us it's, it's been a crucial focus area within uh, the ASEAN and uh, broader Asia region. Now just touching lastly um, on a few uh, questions for thought. I'm sure many of you will have many questions already. Um, I hope some of us can attempt to, to answer some of them. Um, but, you know, things like the importance of speeding up um, public-private financing. You know, Johan's talked about some of the work that they're doing to help this happen. This happen. You know, what's also the role of agri-tech and financial tech as an enabler to that? Um, I've mentioned the importance of the NDC dialogue. This is crucially important because of the 2020 deadline. Um, and also thinking about setting targets at a landscape level, rather than just focusing on single commodities. Um, and then also, um, how can the private sector set robust targets um, so that they're actually affordable in terms of the systems that they can put in place to measure these things and meet the goals that we're talking about, very lofty goals. Um, and then finally, the dietary shift debate. I mentioned the challenge that uh, we have around uh, diets, both in terms of hunger and in terms of overnutrition. Um, and what is the role in uh, protein production uh, and what will that mean for production systems in order to try and drive down greenhouse gas emissions? So many of these things are very much on the radar for our members, uh, a lot of the events that we come to. And uh, I just wanted to finish off. Finish off Great. Thank you so much, Tony, uh, for taking us through the ambitious commitments that WBCSD members have made and the critical actions that you and they are leading to scale up solutions for climate smart agriculture and food security. And I really like your food for thought questions, too, uh, which are a perfect transition to now the most exciting part of our event, which are your questions and thoughts, all of you joining us here today. And we have a number of great questions coming in, so everyone please keep typing uh, your, questions in the, uh, your questions in the webinar chat box so that we can get to those. And just to mention before we dive into Q&A, uh, I'm really happy to see we have 85 people joining us here from more than 12 countries globally, including Sri Lanka, Italy, Ethiopia, Canada, Cyprus, Dominican Republic, France, Australia, Thailand, Madagascar, and more. So we truly have a global uh, community of practice here, uh, very engaged in, and interested in these issues. So to start off our q and I'm going to pose two quick clarifying questions for Johan and Tony that came in during your presentations. And then we'll move to some of the more broader questions that have been raised for discussion. So for Johan, two questions. One from Eric Hyman, who leads and oversees the CEDAR program from USAID's Economic Policy Office. Eric asked, uh, related to one of your slides, why is the potential forestry investment number for ASEAN so small in the DBS UNEP graph? 
And another one for you, Johan, from Duncan Gromko, who would like to hear more about the profile of businesses that uses that USAID Green Invest Asia is supporting to access investment. How big are those businesses, and how much track record do they have? Duncan mentioned that in his experience, the challenge is to find firms with sustainable business models that also have enough track record to convince investors. So Johan, be thinking about those. I'll come back to you in just a moment for your responses. And then two questions for Tony. Uh, the first, also from Eric Hyman, what are WBCSD's activities related to land conversion for palm oil and burning of sugarcane fields before harvesting? And another from Todd Johnson, who is in USAID's Asia Bureau. Uh, he asks, um, he, he noted, it's great to see that many of the Fortune 100 global multinationals are recognizing their roles in the Sustainable Development Goals and other sustainability practices. And Todd noted that many of the companies ranked in the one, 101 to 500 range are also, if a little bit more slowly, joining the Davos consensus as markets and investors pull and push them into the 21st century. So the question for you, Tony, from Todd is, how do we accelerate that engagement with those ranked uh, 501 to 1,000 on the Fortune list of global companies, especially those who are privately held and therefore less responsive to investor advocacy. So Tony, be thinking about those two questions. And Johan, I'd love Thank your you, thoughts uh, briefly on the on first the two first questions. Question and then we'll come back to Tony. The potential for, to the Tony. potential for forestry investment in the DBS graph. I'm not very familiar with the, the methodology that is used by DBS to, uh, to assess this, but what we can say is that, first of all, palm and rubber and this kind of uh, product would not be integrated, so that would make a big chunk. But what we also see is that a lot of forestry, forest owner, land owner, are not necessarily looking for bank finance. There is also a lot of, in Asia especially, maybe more than many other regions, a lot of own internal financing through family relatives, even for relatively large investment like forestry. That's for the, the first point. And on the second point, on the track record of business, the type of businesses we are targeting mostly at uh, Green Invest Asia are SMEs and mid-growth businesses. So let's say a little bit larger than SMEs. And yes, it's difficult to find businesses with track record. And especially, it's a track record that they are capable of selling. So many of them are large enough to, to actually be successful if they are this size is because they already managed to grow quite a lot. But selling that to an external investor is not always easy. It's sometimes easier with local banks because they understand probably better what the business is trying to sell. But for foreign investors, for equity investors, for example, it's also much more difficult for these companies to do that. Great. Thank you so much, Johan. Sure. And Tony, two over questions. to you for you two, um, the two questions. Very interesting. The uh, work that we've been doing, for example, with uh, Soft Commodities Forum, um, who are a group of, of traders, has been looking at uh, impacts and issues in the Cerrado on land conversion deforestation around the soil. Now, you could very easily uh, change the word uh, Cerrado with Indonesia, and you could very easily change the word soy uh, with palm. Uh, these are another um, important commodity to look at. Um, we've been working particularly around areas of land conversion, landscape fires in Indonesia, working closely with the Indonesian Business Council for Sustainable Development to address on-farm practices and policies that can help uh, tackle this issue. Um, but it's also very much on the site of the Soft Commodities Forum. Um, and we work closely with the Consumer Goods Forum as well, who've done a lot of work on sustainable palm certification. Very interesting question as well around the, the smaller, maybe Fortune uh, 100 or less uh, companies out there, and also the privately held companies. Um, obviously, it's a slightly different way um, of talking about the issues, but I think depending on the type of company, the issues are the same. I mean. For many of these companies um, who are exposed to risks around um, less sustainable or unsustainable practices within food and agriculture value chains, they are exposed to huge uh, risks of um, continuation of operations, um, of impacts on price, uh, volatility, 
Um, and this is going to be a challenge for their own businesses and to meet their own profits. Um, and so importantly, uh, the same um, information and communication needs to be had with those organizations. Um, and hopefully over time, that argument will get through and we can have as many organizations as possible involved um, in um, more sustainable practices. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tony. Very, very good points there. So two kind of related questions that I'd like uh, both of your thoughts on these. Uh, one from Lok uh, Sapkota asks, what are the support options for startups for sustainable land use, such as agroforestry and ecotourism? And then a second question from Raman Antosa Sergey noting that land use is a big challenge in Madagascar because tools for securing land and for land planning are poor and it's hard to get loans from finance institutions because most of the local farmers don't have titles or certificates for their land. So for both Tony and Johan, how have you so for both Tony and Johan, how have you seen those types of challenges addressed? Yeah, I will reply quickly maybe, on the, maybe the Johan first for your so thoughts on that. At Green Vestasia, like I said, we focus on slightly larger businesses, no so not so much uh, growth like early stage in startups. But the main Two tools on the investment side are obviously incubators. They are more and more in the regions for, for startups, so that's very useful on the skills and network side. And there are surprisingly a lot of small impact investment funds in, in Asia at national level. Not regional funds, because these tend to be larger funds for larger investments, but for startups, there are a lot of smaller impact funds, like especially many of them based out of Singapore. So that, that would be one. And on the land tenure part is obviously a, a big issue everywhere in the world if you talk about agriculture. I mean, Tony will talk about this more. But one reason why land tenure are a big challenge in the financial part, in the financial side, is because land, land title are very often used as collateral for loan. And without a proper solid land title, most of the producers have too little assets to pledge as collateral and therefore cannot assess a loan. So one solution to overcome this challenge is to work with producers, smallholders, and their buyers to create takeoff agreements so that they can show to a bank, to an investor, that they have a, um, a purchase, that they have a client waiting for the, the produce, and therefore can access the loan based for their, their production based on this takeoff agreement. Great. Thanks yeah, so much, Johan. And Tony, your answer. thoughts on these um, questions? I wish I could come up with such a good answer as well. Um, but I, I would move towards the importance of an organization um, which was, was set up called the Global Agribusiness Alliance. This was set up um, by Sunny Pagazi, who is the CEO of OLAM. Um, one of the reasons for setting this up is to look at sustainable development issues for agribusinesses smaller small and medium-sized agribusinesses, particularly in areas like Southeast Asia um, as well as West Africa. I think there's a real importance of bringing these businesses um, on board to setting up the types of systems that we've been talking about, you know, understanding the capacity to scale, um, having the technical capacity to look at um, these risks and the value chain. Um, in particular, GAA, the Global Agri Business Alliance, has been doing a lot of work on smallholder transitions, um, on land rights and admin and it, titles is absolutely true here and um, it's a crucial issue and I would also say uh, we've been doing a lot of work on, on data uh, for climate smart agriculture and as much as possible if there is a good way in which um, data can be uh, generated, stored and disseminated um, in a way that allows easy access to this type of information on land um, and hopefully it can help um, these types of issues in Madagascar we're also some of our members um, are particularly um, active on um, on crops like vanilla, but it shouldn't just be about those commodity crops. It should also be about obviously the landscapes, obviously the landscapes, um, and the other crops that are grown and, and activities by farmers in those areas. Very very good points. Thanks so much to you both for that. 
So three related questions that I'd love your thoughts on. Uh, first, from Michael Phillips asks, could you please cite some successful examples of domestic pension funds or insurance companies that have invested in climate resilience and climate smart agriculture? Second question from Willen Colin Brander, any role for weather index insurance in financing the conservation farming value chain? And the third related question here from Alan Miller asks, many measures, he notes, many measures for climate smart agriculture depend on the availability of high quality weather and climate information, such as index insurance. Do the countries that you're working with have the necessary localized reliable weather data? So taking those three questions, um, yeah, well, Tony or Johan, yeah, anyone want to jump in on those first? On, uh, in particular, I'd like to answer the question on, on weather data. Um, I think this is a crucially important issue. Um, obviously, each country will vary. Um, and there are, um, looking at Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, many of the Southeast Asian countries are, are more advanced. But looking at Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the access to weather data, uh, the way in which this data is generated, um, is, is very low. Um, you need local weather stations. You can get these stations for two and a half thousand dollars now. They used to cost twenty five thousand, um, and they can still meet the International Meteorological Agency um, organization standards. And so, I think in, increasingly the infrastructure is needed. And you're absolutely right to bring up that question about saying how can we have robust index uh, and weather insurance if we don't have insurance if we don't have robust data. Um, which is going to bring down the premiums, which is going to make sure that the right people get paid at the right time. Um, so I really think that there are good solutions out there. We've been working with an organization called Kukua, K-U-K-U-A. Um, they've been installing uh, low-cost but high-tech weather stations in uh, and around Africa, and we've already been talking about the application of these technologies in, uh, in Southeast Asia for areas where, uh, where, where coverage is a bit less as well. Yeah, I will. Thanks so much, the, Tony. And yeah, Johan, please, your thoughts on this. Basically, talking about the weather index insurance. This is really crucial in terms of financing smallholders because what happens is that most of the time, local banks will find it very difficult to finance smallholders if there is no insurance behind it. So the insurance is important to insure, in, in, of course, the, the, the smallholders, but also to enable them to access finance loans for, to prepare their production, their, their harvest. And the difficulty with that is that, like Tony said, it requires quite some infrastructure, and these are less and less expensive, which is a good thing, but it also requires historical data, usually 10, 15 years of historical data on, on weather patterns. And that is, in many countries, very difficult to find at local level, because you can't do it on, at a national level. It doesn't make sense. You need that data to be focused for each um, locality. And that is very difficult to do and very costly and therefore very difficult to implement. So weather index insurance is indeed crucial, but it's not often available for, for farmers. And when it is, it's not a very cheap product, so it's also very difficult sometimes to explain to a farmer why they should pay additional for an insurance that maybe they will not get any benefit out of contrary to a loan, which is much easier to, to explain. And the, the last question was about domestic pension fund and insurance fund. I will be honest, that's not an area that we have yet investigated. I know it's very, very important, especially in terms of forestry, because pension fund and insurance fund are typically uh, investors, long-term investors in, in the forestry sector in, in developing countries. So it would be very important to be able to get pension fund and insurance fund to use environmental and social criteria when they do their investment in forestry in Asia. And that's an area that is yet for us to, uh, to develop. But just to, Tony here, just to add on to that though, just on the, the investment point, I think it's Wonder. a really good question. It's, it's, yeah, it's Tony. a difficult one, but it's a really good question. Um, we, I, I mentioned earlier the work at WPCSD we're doing around redefining value as being the, the central core of the way in which these risks are integrated into the financial and non-financial reporting by companies. Uh, we have something called the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, 
TCSD and look it up. Um, it's important because it starts bringing in um, specific examples um, of these risks. And while I can't answer the question in detail, um, I invite you to look at that program because that's trying to get a more of an investment orientated way to look at why you would actually be implementing these solutions and why insurance solutions and why insurance funds, for example, should be involved in them, as well as conservation funds, um, which was brought up. Excellent. Thank, thanks so much to you both for those really, really good thoughts on, on those questions. Two more related questions related to this, this critical issue of scale for investment. The first one is from Michelle Jennings, and she asks, what is the tipping point for Climate Smart Agriculture to be a mainstay agricultural approach at scale? Michelle notes that it sounds like a quadruple win for the environment, farmers, consumers, and the private sector, yet Climate Smart Agriculture has not yet cut across global large-scale agriculture. Why? How has the lack of research investments hampered these approaches? So that's the first question. Second question is from Supasuk Pradubsuk, or BIRD, uh, calling in from uh, USAID's Regional Development Mission for Asia in Bangkok. Great to have you join us, BIRD. And she asks a uh, question for Tony. Could you please explain a bit more about WBCSD's strategic approach you see for shifting from supporting climate smart agriculture in a single commodity, such as rice, to taking a landscape level approach in addressing multiple commodities, given that stakeholders and ecosystems are, are different and varied within that landscape scale? So um, either uh, okay, so Tony or Johan, jump in on these the questions. Scale about what is the, where is the tipping point for climate smart agriculture to become mainstream. I think there are two main challenges that are so far hampering that. And one is the classic typical agriculture challenges, so not necessarily related to sustainability, but just financing farmers, lack of collaterals, and the, the, the classic issues that we know of. And the other is related to sustainability in the sense that using Climate smart agriculture is a change of habits for the farmers and for the other SMEs, meaning using different techniques with sometimes different costs. You can see that in number of cases, for example, sustainable agriculture can be slightly less productive than traditional non-sustainable agriculture. The cost can also be different and higher. And that is sometimes difficult for farmers. If the farmer is already convinced, or if the SME is already convinced of the use of doing this, it's still a challenge to convince an investor, a bank, a bank that has seen the same cost for the last 10 to 20 years, and now is presented with another business, another agricultural business with different cost patterns that he doesn't know or doesn't fully understand. And that makes it even more difficult for sustainable agriculture in a number of cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would, I mean, to add to that, um, I mean, take the, the, the cycle of research to policy to extension uh, within agricultural development. I mean, much of that in uh, many um, countries with developing agricultural systems in the world has taken quite a conventional approach to agriculture. So some of the solutions that we're talking about here, which, like Johan says, are still relatively costly, things which haven't been widespread integrated into extension advice. If you want to achieve something like alternate wet dry, you have to change the type of extension policy, the extension advice that reaches right down to the smallholder level. Um, that can take time. It can take years, in fact. Um, and so achieving that scale is around you know, taking the time to look at the, you know, the devil is in the detail on those policies and making sure you get the extension advice of the right and also, I've experienced um, in, in my professional time uh, resistance by um, ministers to some of these you know, different approaches, which includes agroecological approaches like conservation agriculture. I mean, minimum till agriculture is crucially important, particularly in mountainous areas um, of the world, tackling soil erosion. Um, Sometimes there is resistance to this within uh, ministerial policy because it's seen as relatively old-fashioned and, you know, not the conventional model, technological, technological approach. Um, so sometimes it's also just about, um, you know, hearts and minds um, in policy. 
And then I was just going to also talk about, you know, the markets and the size of the market. Um, and this leads me on to the landscape question. Um, the interesting one about the rice landscape is, I mean, that's exactly why the private and public sector and development partners are, are putting this proposal into the global environment facility, because we want to look at not just rice as a single commodity, but everything which is happening within a rice landscape or the Mekong Delta. Um, many different cereal crops can be grown there, obviously horticultural crops all sorts. Um, so the landscape-based approach has to be multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral, and multi-company. Um, OLAM's just put together a, a landscape policy for how it wants to do its work, and I think that the rice example I gave, or rice landscape's example, is a good way of trying to get there. The other challenge around scaling this up is the markets. Um, the offtake, you know, for take Mars. Mars owns Uncle Ben's uh, rice, and very little, little, you know, rice branded product sits on the super. So there's Tilda, there's Uncle Ben's, there's a few others, but a lot of the rice um, is consumed and traded domestically within um, smallholder and uh, local markets. So the offtake agreements that large corporates might sign up to might not be enough to scale this to what we need. So we need markets in, in the East, markets in China as well to come on board with some of these, uh, these approaches and concepts to, to get scale. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony and Johan. Uh, and thanks so much to everyone who has joined us here today. It's been an absolutely fantastic discussion with great insights and perspectives shared by everyone who joined us. And I just want to mention that the questions that we weren't able to get to today um, will be answered via email and sent to everyone in the next week or so. So thank you so much for all of the questions. Really thoughtful and um, provocative um, ideas there. Um, also, just to mention that a recording of today's presentation will be sent to everyone who registered for today's webinar, as well as posted on USAID's Climate Links YouTube page, uh, where uh, people can watch previous CEDAR series discussions as well. So with that, um, we also have a number of additional resources from uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, USAID Green Invest Asia, and CEDAR noted here on the slides as references. And those will be available in the webinar recording as well. So with that, thank you again, everyone. And want to wish you all the best in the important work that you're leading on these issues around the world. We very much look forward to uh, continuing the discussion, continuing our collective collaboration on these, on these issues, 